you are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast. The title of today's show is I'm never ever going to make a show title again. That supplied on Twitter by Form 5411. The runner up was Rolf Rasmussen with Return of the Mag, although I'm suspecting he wants me to go Return of the Mag. There we go. Nice 90s reference for you there. And a special mention in dispatches for Philby Scrolling with The Horses Prance, The Bulls Break. And KMAG is now Steiner's favourite four-letter word. I'm your host, Richard Spanners. Ready? Welcome to the Bahrain Race Review. It's been many months of wondering what this regulation change would bring. And the answer is it's reinvigorated the sport. Change has happened. The order is different for now. And Ferrari have finally delivered on a pre-season promise and converted that into on-track performance, staking an early claim to both titles. So this week we're going to discuss that stunning win by Charles Leclerc and the heartbreak, of course, at Red Bull, the damage limitation and a fight ahead for Mercedes-Benz. And we'll take a close look at what the new regulations have delivered us in race one. And of course, how could we not talk about the comeback kid, Kevin Magnussen? Don't call it a comeback. He never left. Well, he did leave so that doesn't work. But we are an independent podcast produced in the podcasting shed with the kind permission of our better halves. We aim to bring you a race review before your Monday morning commute. We might be wrong, but we're first. I'm joined in the shed as I so often am by Matt Two Rumpets. I'm just enjoying a nice glass of indication over here and can't wait to get the show started. He's going to bring up the Haas conversation and where they were going to end up, isn't he? Uh, we're joined by our race analyst, Alex Jeansy Van Jean. How's it going, Alex? All good. See? See? Ferrari weren't overcompensating. Oh, this is going to be hell. And Christian Pedersen. So I'm just getting ready for the Danish general population to go crazy again. Yeah, yeah. Good to have that fan base back on board. Let's dive straight into where the race was won and lost. Well, Matt, I guess it's um, it's hard to look away when you look at where the race was won and lost. I know we we tend to look to strategy in this part, but nearly instantly the new regulations just delivered that fantastic battle between Charles Leclerc and Max Verstappen. Yeah, they did. And if you're looking for where the race was won and lost, and you're going to ignore the fact that no Red Bull actually finished the race, which I'm going to do for these purposes, then there is no place more important than turn one, lap 19, when our friend from Monaco absolutely baited Verstappen into breaking too late and won himself the race. Uh, Now, Van Jean, this is like a really classic swapping of positions battle with like two long straights. Obviously, there's DRS in in Formula One, and we'll we'll go into what effect DRS had on this race. But when you've got slipstream and two long straights, it it becomes almost tactical. Sometimes you, you kind of don't want to overtake, but Verstappen just had the bit between his teeth, and he was like, now or never. I think Verstappen was driving angry today. He was told, he was given instructions on how to treat the tyres when doing the first lap on the tyres and didn't agree with the decision and was then driving angry. Um, but to be fair, Leclerc played him like a fiddle today. Um, he real he, he ushered him in, brought him in, gave him the space, let Max do the lunge that he knew Max would do. Because what we have to remember, and we're going to have to remember this for all of this season, Max and Charles have history. Big history, going all the way back to their karting days. There's some great video footage of them two having arguments post-race about who hit who off the circuit. So um, we're going to see a lot of that this season. And what Charles Leclerc do was, did was brilliant, was just let Max know he can have a run into Turn 1 and let him do it three or four times to the last point where he literally moved straight out of the way to give him to give him the room to do it. Max should have been more sensible. After not getting it done the first or second time, he should have waited 
not made the move at turn one and then got him into turn four. But I think uh, Max was too hot-headed today and Charles got the better of him. Yeah, we're, we're, we know more than F1 drivers, don't we, Alex? I do, I do. I love a bit of sofa punditry. But look, the, a, a lot of people were saying that. It was quite clear that if you got it into turn one, you're going to be vulnerable into turn two. So w- what was going in his head? Did he, did he really think, if I, get, if I get him into turn one, I'll be able to hold it into turn two? I think it might have been a case, actually, I'll go to you, Matt. It might have been a case that he didn't quite get that he wasn't the fastest package today. And, that, and actually, Leclerc was the fastest driver car package. Uh, yeah, I think, I think initially, uh, coming out of the pits, it might it might have been just i'm not sure because he was on the cold tires max's tires were fully warmed up but after the first pass at turn 1 and the ease with which he caught him up on the way to turn 4 i think leclerc knew that as long as long as he could go wide make a good exit out of turn 1 and follow max he would take him into turn four as long as he felt like it and without too much trouble which led to some spectacular the second time round, he like looked like he just drifted the car across Verstappen's nose. Just amazing car control and use of of the brakes. It was a bit of a, if you want to make a soccer reference or something like that, it was a bit of like a nutmeg. <laughs> it was. I completely agree with Alex that uh, he he didn't just defend. He sort of played with Max Verstappen. And and you can you could also read in the way uh, Verstappen drove his car. He, he was like, okay, I can't do this because he's got the upper hand. The way he's doing it, he sort of his 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 driving driving style sort of went into manual or whatever you say. Auto, he, auto, he backed yeah. Off. Yeah, he he backed off basically, just quit it. And uh, I, I've never seen that from Max Verstappen before, and I've never seen Charles Leclerc race that hard up front in in a superior car. I mean, it was wonderful. I tell you what, it's it's definitely it's answered a lot of questions today, Matt. I think in a moment, I think we'll talk about the effect the new regulations had on this battle. But I think it's it's fair to focus on these two individuals, as as Matt was sa- as uh, Alex was saying, they've got some history going back into the karting days and stuff like that. But I I said on a Twitter space yesterday, my worry was actually about Charles Leclerc's mentality and whether he could hold it together up front because he's so emotional, heart in his sleeve, so self-critical. And actually, uh, to me, Alex, Verstappen always just seems, for all his faults, he seems very cool, like nothing can touch him, nothing's ever going to take it away, very confident in his own skin. We had a bit of a reversal today. Alex, then, Matt. Yeah, um, Clark, Clark? <laughs> um, Charles was absolutely the coolest customer's day. He was in complete control. He had no issues. He just drove, sounds ridiculous, but he just drove his car. He just did what he needed to do. There was, you never saw a mistake, a lockup, a, a bit of wide, nothing. He just did perfectly. On the radio, you hardly heard from him. I don't actually think we heard from him all race, to be honest, on the radio, which means he didn't say much of much of note. But Max, we heard him screaming and shouting all over the radio after every single pit stop and in various different stages of the race. So, um, yeah, I think um, as far as the mental battle is concerned, Charles had everything on Max today. Just a quick note on that, Matt, is that the race directors choose who to broadcast and who not to, and they can set their own narrative. And they've certainly, you know, overplayed Lewis Hamilton's pit messages in the past, but Max has now got the number one on his car and golden boots. So maybe we'll we'll hear, you know, more of a narrative showing his radio messages. I just wanted to caveat that slightly. Yeah, I, I did want to get in with, uh, for all of his coolness last season, at least, uh, on TV, he certainly didn't sound cool every time they broadcast his radio messages. He sounded the very opposite of cool, like he knew he had limited chances to get ahead of that Ferrari, and it was going to take everything he had to stay ahead. Yeah, well, I think it's worth looking at this being a showcase for the new regulations, Christian. Like, if, if you were the F1 guys and you've been building up these regulations, you can follow, the DRS will work, it will give you close racing. That delivered, like, instantly. They must have been whooping and celebrating whichever way that went. And it wasn't just, like, new sort of regulations. It was, uh, it was everything. So if we just take it from, a, from a, a track layout sort of kind of perspective, 
new race director enters, says white line everywhere. If you cross it all four wheels, you're off the track. It's a penalty. New rules in regards to how we uh, administrate it. So if we see someone do that, we're not going to tell the team anything. We're going to let the team fix it within the, f- the lab they're on. If not, we're going to send it to the stewards. And thirdly, and I think that is so important because that is what has been on everyone's mind the last year. If you go into a corner and you press one car wide so it has to leave the track, you're in the wrong. You're and, in the wrong, I mean. And we saw with the side-to-side where Verstappen had the opportunity to do a Verstappen manoeuvre, he didn't seem to be doing that today. And it was a, it exactly. was a quite a change because I was waiting for the push wide. It didn't come, so they must have been told. In fact, the only manoeuvre I saw of that uh, calibre, I think, was on lap one where Hamilton very much pushed Perez straight off the track. But Verstappen, in those wheel-to-wheel battles, where I think last season it would have been just carry on into oblivion, it, it looked clean and it was it was good racing. So whatever they've said, it might have had an effect. I also think the cars are, are driven differently this year. So I think it's uh, still drivers finding their feet in the cars. So uh, so we're probably going to see more hard racing in, in the near future, I guess. Um, yeah, when it comes to talking about the way the cars are different to drive... You literally have to get all your braking done in a straight line. I think trail braking is almost a thing of the past because what Martin Brundle was saying during the during the broadcast was when you brake in a straight, you have to brake in a straight line, then get it turned. Because if you try and brake while turning, you lose all your downforce. So this is interesting to me because one thing that I read coming up to the race uh, in qualifying was an analysis by Mark Hughes where he accused signs of crossing over the throttle in the brake during the turn as as part of his tactic. I know it's not a thing that we used to see, but I think the drivers are going to have to figure out how to use their tools differently given the primitive level of suspension that they now have. When the drivers are asked to compare it to something, the new cars, all of them say GP2 cars. So basically, that's uh, V8 engines and heavier cars, which needs a lot more braking, but still have a lot of aerodynamics. But when you're on the gas in these cars, it's different. And the drivers, when when you've optimized the car and the driver learned the technique with getting on the on on the throttle and just making that downforce, creating the downforce with the car. When all that is set up, these cars are going to be amazing. So one thing we speculated on was longer braking zones. And I think we saw an example of that going down the, the, the start-finish straight where it looked like Verstappen was way too far back. And then they go into that braking zone and suddenly Verstappen was there, which I think surprised Leclerc. And I think, you know, you have to go, well, that is actually, that was a great overtake by Verstappen, whether or not he should have been pushing for that turn one overtake at all we can debate but if if that is if that's a, a true indication matt of of how the cars are behaving in the braking zones it means i think we're going to see a lot more tactical racing and a lot more corners become overtaking spots which is that's and i'm i'm just really encouraged and i want to get carried away because i know it's a good track for racing anyway but i think early signs are oh wow they they actually have done something about the racing yeah, sadly, if we're going to be really scientific about it, you'd say we're going to need a few more data points before we no. can really enforce this <laughs> conclusion. But I want to get on to what you're saying. Yeah. Because the primitive suspensions now, relative to what they used to have, has made the braking zones and the acceleration, the traction zones out of the corners incredibly important. And we saw a number of small driver mistakes uh, result in in place changes. Um, particularly, I'm thinking of uh, Gasly turn 15 when he got ahead of Magnussen after the pit stop. Dialed up some amazing wheel spin onto the straight, and that made the pass so easy for Magnussen. And Magnussen, when he was ahead of Perez, locking up into mm. turn one, and it was just it was a done deal. So the drivers are going to be a much bigger percentage of the package performance with these regulations and where the teams are right now in terms of getting, I guess, two terms with them. I think we have to take into consideration the purposing. Uh, So when you're going down the straight and if you have uh, like an extended braking zone now, I see some of that purposing heading into the braking zone. So if you're, for instance, in the Mercedes, which is uh, quite heavily uh, affected by the purposing, 
and you have a guy like Hamilton who, who who's really like hard on braking, and that is maybe one of his uh, hardest yeah. or best points. If you have a car that doesn't do it right there, you you lose a lot of confidence. And I, I remember during the, the 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 practice session, they had some front right front polling, which means when you brake, the car actually just want to turn to one side. Uh, and if you have a car that drives like that, it's it's impossible to to set a fast time. They fixed that for the race, of course, but I think you see that all everywhere. People experimenting with their brake mm. zones and how they set up the cars for that. Yeah, uh, it's, let's look at let's go back to these um, these two drivers and th- their performances. So, Alex, you had pointed this to this as being like a great performance by Charles Leclerc, and I will try my best to say Charles Leclerc, not Charles Leclerc. All right, I'll appease the, <laughs> those people. Charles Leclerc, um, d- do we think it was a great performance? So, uh, obviously, he won and he did really well, and like you said, no mistakes. But for example, if you looked at Lewis Hamilton in Brazil. He clearly had the best driver package. So how do we say that was still a good performance? Well, we talked about how he teased out the different overtaking moves and positioning into the last corner. And he figured that out you know, car by car. And we, we did class that as a great performance. Uh, what sets this apart as a good performance? So do, do we think we had the best car? And, and did it make a difference what he did, as it were? Or was it simply a case of not making mistakes? It's the case there was no panic from him. He just had this cool head, which is a case of, okay, I've got the package here. You know, I'm not, it's not like a couple of times last year when he got pole and he's like, oh, I'm on pole and everyone's going to be coming for me. It's like, okay, I've got pole. And then after the first few laps, when he had Max at, at arm's length, he was like, oh, okay, I've got this under control. And he just managed everything. He never looked, he never looked like he was pushing, even when Max was attacking him. He never looked like he was pushing. He looked like he had it completely under control. And yes, Charles probably had the best package today. Um, but both, I'm going to say number two drivers, even though I don't really consider Carlos a number two. Ah, oh, um, I'll argue with you. But, okay, go on. Um, <laughs> but he just had it completely under control. Again, if it was, if there was no Max Verstappen and no Charles Leclerc, this would have been a very, very different race. But... Um, those two are class acts. And I'm going to say that we can easily conclude the Ferrari, at least in the hands of Leclerc, was the best because when Verstappen came back in for his pit stop and put on the softs near the end of the race, they did pit signs, but they did not pit Charles. Don't forget, signs weekend has been horrible. He, he, he finished second. But every time they talked to uh, to uh, uh, Carlos Sainz, they, he was, what what is going on? I can't drive the car. So I mean that remarks on Leclerc as well. He just gets in the car, gets it done. Uh, I think uh, Sainz would have been 15, 20 seconds behind him if it wasn't for the safety car. One thing that I do want to get into when we're talking about this battle, and this was the, actually the second of my places where the race was won and lost is if we think about Leclerc coming out of the pit lane after Verstappen undercuts him, the performance of those cold tires absolutely gave Max the opening. And it's entirely to Leclerc's credit that he kept ahead of Verstappen until that first straight, which set up the whole turn one, turn four resonance cycle that we then got to witness delightfully for lap after lap after lap yeah so look i'm not trying to do the oh we only one because you had the best car i'm not trying to do that i'm trying to go actually what what does set this performance aside because it's being universally praised as a, a great performance so i, I want to pick that apart and one thing defending on the cold tires i'd completely forgotten uh, the moment where we saw lewis hamilton coming out on hard tires so cold hard tires and suddenly you go ooh that's new that's different like lewis hamilton is is no mug yet there he was matt at really demonstrating is this, is this a, a lack of tire blankets I, i'd forgotten that was a thing it's they do have tire blankets the temperatures are different and the tires themselves are different so the temperatures are lower and it takes it takes as you see at least half a lap if not more a full lap to really get them fully up to temperature when they go on in the pit lane 
and uh, we saw Hamilton, we saw Magnuson have the same problem. And again, this is these new regulations you were talking about. I can't remember the numbers exactly, but I think it was 90, 100 uh, before, and now it's 70, 80 sort of. So it's, it's around 20% lower. Yeah. And the fact is then that the, the, t- the tires are bigger tires as well. So I don't know if that yeah. makes a difference. There's more to cook. Van Jean. The interesting thing with regards to tires was the first like three or four laps on those tires were absolutely rapid. You know, you'd see the driver's fastest lap times and then they'd kind of plateau off by about a second and then just sit there for the rest of the stint. So it's very interesting that the way the way the tires are being used now. So that's why we saw such a massive undercut from any driver that stopped first, which obviously very nearly caught Ferrari out in the first stop. Yeah. Um, but that's why I think Charles Leclerc pulled out that bit more of a gap and was much more ready for it and they pitted the following lap. Um, so it's very very, very interesting to see the way they're going to have to use the tyres in the first stage of their life. Yeah, because Matt, it looks now like the undercut is like super powerful. If it's like that, it's going to be everywhere. You're just going to see people diving into the pits. And if you look at Hamilton, he wasn't happy at pitting in early and it didn't work out, but it did show that you could make, he did make up a little gap. You know, obviously it was then on harder tyres, but yeah, undercut, super powerful. When you factor in the fact that you're out on cold tyres, the fact that uh, you, I think you have to cool the car down. They told Hulkenberg, your your car is too hot to pit. So at some point, instead of the hammer time, using up all your tyres, you go, right, you're coming in for a pit stop. Let's chill out for a bit. Let's cool down. And then you've got to warm it up. And the suggestion, I think, was that, that if you go too hard on the cold tyres, you will then damage them for the rest of the stint. So Van Jean, then Matt. Mine's more of a question probably aimed at Matt. There you did go. we ever get any... Did we ever get any... Um, reasoning as to why the car was too hot to pit for uh, Nico Hulkenberg. I would guess that probably his brakes had overheated a bit. I know that all the teams were struggling with brake cooling. Um, I think specifically Mercedes teams, but but you know certainly McLaren had a problem through all of testing. So I would guess when they say too hot, it's probably um, he'd over overcooked the brakes and they felt like if he stopped in the pit lane that long, they might catch fire. Beyond that, I didn't hear anything specific. So that's just mm. me guessing with no facts whatsoever. But I mean, the, the point that led us there was the undercut now being like a super powerful tool. And it's worth remembering the tires way more if you looked at the pit stop times. We were seeing 3.4, 3.8, whereas last season, we were down around the two seconds. So a chunk of that undercut is the longer pit stop time because of the heavier wheels. And to answer your question from before, Spanners, actually the tires this year are made to, if you, if you like go hard on them, sort of pre-graining, don't destroy them, but really drive them hard. You can relax them for a couple of laps and they will regain their strength and go back. And most of the drivers uh, have positive uh, experiences with this. And that, that, that's very positive. So that means you can, of course, not the first lap when you drive out of the pits because they're going to be cold. But as soon as you're racing, you can go for a lap and then back off for a couple of laps and go for a lap again without destroying them. Mm, I think what I'd like is if these regulations it looks to me like they're going to encourage multiple stop races so in the previous era you would have tracks if it was even a little bit hard to overtake or they were matched on the straight if you can defend on slightly worn tires i mean singapore is the best example of that and obviously monaco then the incentive is to eke out that stint as long as possible and if the undercut's not so powerful there's no incentive for the car to behind to do anything other than save tires try and go a bit longer you know the hamilton stint one tactics sit there stalk save your tires they pit you go oh no actually my tires were fine and go and go nuts and kind of overcut but now if there's an incentive to undercut and that is going to bring a gap and, and the incentive is to cover off because you don't want that gap to be closed and you'll be vulnerable on cold tires that is in itself alex going to lead to two stop three stop races yeah, which is what we want to see because it messes it messes it all up. That's the wrong word. It 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 mum it jumbles it all up. Yeah, which is great to see. Chance but for strategy, you, isn't it? But when you talk about Lewis pitting early, the reason Lewis ended up having to pit early was because he saw a chance to get after Carlos Sainz. And he obviously pushed very, very hard in the beginning of that stint to mm. try and keep with and hopefully pass 
car lost sight, which I think in turn destroyed his tires because he then dropped back from um dropped back from Carlos, got passed by Sergio, and even um George was catching him by about almost a second a lap at that point. Um and the overcut is actually what saved him. However, the thing that probably saved Lewis in the end was the safety car because Lewis had to do that that third pit stop. I don't think George was going to do another pit stop. So Lewis would have had to have catched like 10 seconds to try and catch and then maybe overtake George. So we actually don't know how that would have played out, especially with regards to Merck and team orders and all those kind of things. So very, very interesting. Also uh, confirmed after the race that uh, they were very surprised by the hot tire. Uh, They had no idea it would be so slow. So uh, they were not going to use that again. He's sort of joked. Yeah, in fact, I went and looked, and um, the shortest stint on any tire was the hard tire. 18 laps was the longest anyone went on on the hard tire. 22 for the soft, 24 for the medium. So that tells you that for some reason, the hard tire really wasn't working in Bahrain today. Okay, let's forget about the Red Bull heartache towards the end of the race and just play it straight with that battle between Charles Leclerc and Max Verstappen. Could Max Verstappen have won that battle? Was it possible? Was it on the cards? He was very, very unhappy at being told not to push early on, not to overheat them, use the tyres. And and then he, he felt like had he pushed all out, he would have been able to overtake, get the lead, and, and then try and hold the lead. And was very, very vocal on the radio. Uh, it was quite, it was quite a, a, a jarring change from his 2021 radio messages I I felt Matt to suddenly there essentially say you told me to do this thing it was wrong you've cost me the lead I'm never ever going to do that tactic again if I if I was like the team manager I feel like I would stand up in a team briefing at some point and go don't mug off the lads like don't mug off the strategists like that it was really it was very very severe it was um and I think uncalled for, especially with regards to the soft tire, because he obviously exercised it vigorously based on his battle with Leclerc, Leclerc that happened because he took so much time yeah. out of him on, on his first outlap. Um, but I think from a driver psychology point of view, from a competitive psychology point of view, I, I read once long ago that it's important to be able to blame other people for mistakes when okay. you're competing. <laughs> right. And I suspect that the engineers at Red Bull are quite used yeah, to being you're right. being the punching bag when the driver needs it, and that's just part of the gig. Yeah, and 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 Martin in our patron Slack group, hello, uh, patron live chat, is saying, yeah, sounds like Hamilton twenty twenty one, and and that's true. And and to be fair, again, I'll point out that the broadcaster picks the narrative, chooses who to broadcast. And I was actually sat there thinking today going, maybe it's not fair. Maybe it's not fair to to broadcast these radio messages in the heat of the moment or have an editor that's got more of a mind of kind of just like protect their reputations a little bit. Like, you know, play the chill ones. If if they just lose it for a second, maybe just let that one go. Put it on the editing floor. Um, Christian. Don't forget Max Verstappen went around like an hour faster around uh, on Fridays, he had it in the back, and then he's in a race where he can just feel his car is not fast enough. And twice in a row, they tell him to go easy on the outlap, and mm-hmm. he just sees his victory just disappear in the distance. I totally understand his feelings. I, I, I agree it's not the right way to talk to the team, yada, yada, but I mean, I can totally understand where he's coming yeah. from. He thought he had it in the back, I'm sure. Uh, Alex, then Matt. It's actually quite interesting, the um, Max Verstappen attitude uh, from post-Saturday, which was very, very similar to his attitude from last season, where I think he came into the weekend, this weekend and last season, thinking he had this in the bag. You know, I thought, I thought, I, I think he probably thought he'd be on pole, disappear off into the distance, and you'd never see him again. And then all of a sudden, he's got some really, really stiff competition, even more so this year than last year. Um, and I think it's caught him off guard. So I think he's got himself frustrated, um, which, you know, was evident in the um, in the radio messages. So, um, you know, he was very circumspect afterwards and was quite content at the end. It was like, ah, do you know what, is what it is, cars fast, whatever. Um, but during the race, I think he was frustrated that he wasn't winning and off in the distance with by a canter. 
Yeah, well, I, having seen one of his post-race interviews, he, he said very clearly that the car lacked the same feeling that it had on Friday and Saturday. So I think he was already aware that he was up against it. Um, and, and then nothing was helping, and that just made it worse. You're telling me that driving on Friday after on Friday afternoon in very very different conditions makes the car different to the actual race in cold conditions in the nighttime. Yeah, but you if, know, if that shows the differences the the setup and stuff can make uh, on a team on, on a team on a car's drivability, then I think we're in for a, a treat this season. But so I want to I want to go to really asking you guys what Ferrari have done right to put themselves in that position. So yes, when testing was happening and they were showing promise. I was saying to people like, like, chill, calm down. They've shown this promise before. Because just on previous trends, you know, they've been the team to, to not hide anything and just kind of go out there and, and, and show their times. Where, whereas we tend to get a bit more surprised by Red Bull and Mercedes when they turn up for testing. This time, obviously, Mercedes have got some problems. I think the, the most common paddock think is that Mercedes have a good car. It's going to take them one or two races to to try and kind of unlock that. And then we know that Red Bull are also very good at developing in season. Perhaps Ferrari a little bit less so traditionally. So we might have a perfect situation really where we've got three teams just converging to the very front of the grid over the next four and four, four or five races, which could be a thrill. But as for now, Matt, what have Ferrari done good? good? Well, the thing they have goodest the most. <laughs> okay, yeah, yes is I do believe at the moment they have the very best power unit on the grid. First of all, and I think you could just look at how qualifying turned out and say, yeah, it does seem that way. And then they've made the terrible mistake of also having the most well-developed aerodynamic package. And it turns out when you put those two things together, yeah, you're pretty you good. have a car that can win races. I will say the gap is less than we've ever seen before. And so that's an exciting thing. Uh, Mercedes, as you point out, rightfully, lots of potential there, lots of room for development. And Red Bull, the same. So it, it's not a done deal by any situation. Mm. It's not like in years past where you would see the team come out and win by 30 seconds. You'd be like, oh, well, there's pretty much your whole season. We don't really have any idea what's going to happen, even at the next race. Yeah, but no one else can get 38 points from Bahrain this season. That's terrible maths. What is it? 43 points or whatever. No, no one else can do that this season. So those points are in the bag and this is part of the season. So they've come out with a complete package ready to go. But I tell you what was surprising was during qualifying, you look at the cars going out in Q1 and you go, hang on a minute. Oh, I wasn't expecting to see that there. I wasn't expecting to see, oh, it's all the Mercedes cars are in trouble. And that, you know, that can't be a coincidence, Matt. And it's, do you remember that feeling? Was it 2020? No, 2019, after the secret Ferrari engine thing. And suddenly all the Ferrari teams kind of took a, a dive down at the same time together. And it kind of looks like Mercedes have done that this time as well. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, you'll be happy to know that Toto Wolf even commented on that after the race. And he mentioned that the power unit still needed some, quote, fine tuning. So I do believe that they, they may have left some of the power out in order to ensure reliability, which what a novel concept in a race where you have to actually cross the finish line in order to uh, make your points. Yeah, I'm sure that'll come up, Matt. Uh, Christian. <laughs> so they, they asked Soto Wolf after the race, uh, post-race, uh, if there was a thing with the Mercedes engine. And I've, I found it strange because I think it was the second time I've heard him being asked this, and then he starts talking about the Mercedes being a bit draggy. So it's like he's not even listening to the question or he's not the, he doesn't want to talk about the engine no. because obviously that will be a big concern if, uh, if this is the reason. So according to him, it's a Mercedes that is draggy and he doesn't want to talk about the other teams. So let's see what happens. But McLaren today, <laughs> I mean, that was not McLaren. That was also Mercedes. Yes. And uh, yeah, that, that is interesting because from a kind of brand point of view, it's okay to say, oh, we got our design a bit wrong and we're just sorting out the tweaks. But to say we've ruined it for us and our three customer teams, that's got a little bit more of an impact you know, from a corporate point of view, hasn't it, man? Yeah, and oh, it's Christian. homologated now for five years. Or what is it, three, four years? 
Uh, 2026 are the new power unit regulations, I believe. Uh, they are able to upgrade the hybrid system in September. And as always, uh, upgrades for uh, reliability um, uh, will be allowed, although it's not, it's not as easy as it used to be in the old days. You sort of have to submit them and the other teams have to look at them and there's mm -hmm. a discussion and then they get approved anyway. But I believe there's room in the Mercedes power unit to be improved and to be to be more properly tuned um and if they can do that without having to replace any of the homologated parts which is what i suspect the issue is then that's what we will see because remember they have the new cooling layouts and all the other stuff that's going on as well so it would it's very mercedes to hold back some performance in favor of reliability and I, I just still have a distinct sense that may be what we're mm. seeing at the moment. It's, it's just so interesting to think how this season is going to develop and emerge. And let's say Mercedes end up being the best car halfway through the season. This is the best possible start to have the team that on paper we would all probably guess will develop the least Ferrari come straight out of the box and look good and have two teams notorious for developing well through a season is actually the best case scenario for an exciting season. But we have to say, complete hats off to uh, both the Ferrari drivers. They've, they've come out, they've obviously designed well, they've obviously worked hard, they've found something, they've come here with a complete package. The car looks drivable, it looks fast, and they've done the work getting two of the best drivers on the grid. So, you know, hats off to, to Ferrari, and um, as, as, as horrible as that might feel... To some people, not me. I'm a I'm a staunch Ferrari fan. Check out my my Twitter at Spanners Ready. But uh, yeah, I think people do have to accept now that Ferrari are a force in this championship. They might not end up winning it, Matt, but they are definitely, definitely a hundred percent in the fight and race winners already. That's right. They may not win it, but they are definitely in it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and to, to to win it, you have to you have to finish. You have to finish right. the race car race. I'm going to go to you, Alex, because this is a test of your professionality. All right. Uh, how how did you feel when the Red Bulls conked out? Oh, I, I was I was I was disappointed because I didn't want it to start like that. Um, you know, I love to I'd love to sit here and say, ha, 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 Red Bull didn't finish, blah, blah, blah. They'll try and blame Renault and Honda for their engines blowing up, even though then, then they'll realize that they actually make their engines these days. But I don't want it to happen like that. Um, you know, technically, Lewis didn't deserve a podium today. So, you know, those Red Bulls did a great job. And that's the battle we should be seeing. Um, but we often see this, that the, one of the strongest cars turns up, has issues in the first race. I mean, the what was it, first race 2014? Lewis lasted a lap and went in with a spark plug issue, yeah. if I remember rightly. Yeah, Magnussen um, came second. Yeah. Magnussen came second that day. So it's the kind of thing where they it will go through a learning process. I want to sit here and have a smile on my face and talk about karma. Um but I'm not going to. And I'm You're going not to actually hiding it very well. And, you and just... I'm going to take the professional high ground and not do a maniacal <laughs> laugh and say it's a real shame for Red Bull because I don't want them to lose out on stuff like this. Because especially if Max loses out on the championship by a point, they'll come back to this race. Okay. I just, I just want to point out that you did say all the things by saying you didn't want to say them. And if that's not a microaggression, uh, I don't know what is. But I think Matt's going to take issue with you saying that Mercedes and Hamilton didn't deserve the podium because, I mean, reliability is part of the game. Indeed it is. And you did not ever hear me say Max Verstappen was not champion last season. That's true. And you're not going to hear me say that Hamilton didn't deserve the podium today because their cars finished and Red Bulls didn't. Now, as to why they didn't finish, now there could be a slightly more interesting story. Tell us. Well, uh, according to Red Bull, the issue was the fuel pump failing, no longer delivering fuel to the power unit. And as I'm sure you all know, the primer fuel pump, which is the one that failed in this instance, is a spec part provided by Magnetti Morelli. And there have been issues with it. Um, specifically, the FIA permitted uh, an extension of time prior to Park for May for teams to pull their uh, fuel cells and check this part to make sure it was working properly. The general consensus is it's probably the E10 fuels and the specific formulations are interacting badly with some of the uh, resin parts 
and causing them to crack, causing fuel to leak. And McLaren, in fact, replaced theirs prior to today's race. Red Bull, to my knowledge, did not. However, it becomes more interesting when you consider that only Red Bull had a failure of this part. And perhaps that is down to the formulation of fuel they are using. Yeah. And it makes a lot of people think about the fuel sensor issue in 2014. Remember when Ricardo briefly won the Australian Grand Prix and then suddenly didn't? I, I just want to just reference the live chat here because uh, Lucas just made a great point that if Verstappen had stopped on track instead of limping into the pits, that would have might have been a safety car and a podium for Sergio Perez. However, they'd already done their there press the button and make Gasly's car catch fire to cause the first safety car it would have looked suspicious if they deliberately and definitely caused two safety cars Christian so <laughs> you just <laughs> you completely threw me out there let me just uh, quickly confirm that the, the the Gasly thing was not a fuel pump that was uh, a fire in the MTUK MG UK. sure yeah sure, I think so too yeah. But uh, don't forget the the the, the special uh, um, fuel uh, this year because some say that if you have the right fuel, you can gain up what's forty horsepower or something like that with the right fuel. And everyone's had to uh, invent new fuels for this year, uh, and this could have something to do with the thing we talked about before, Mercedes as well. Yeah, the E10 fuel has less energy in it uh, per unit of weight, kilogram. And so all the team's fuel suppliers have been working very hard to make that up with the, how that fuel is formulated under the regulations the FIA provides. And I'm not going to get into that because like, it's complicated even for me, if I'm being honest. But the wrong formulation of fuel might be making this fuel pump problem worse. The question then being, why, given the chance, was the problem not solved on Red Bull's end? Okay, before we get into a tech time, I want to move down the grid a little bit. Some people in the chat also saying, you know, why had not we not discussed Sergio Perez at, at all? Because he was kind of in a kind of middle zone, and I guess we could sit and pick apart his his race. I, I don't think it's the most interesting talking point. I think we might catch up with it if we have a midweek catch up or a patron a podcast but uh all i'll say is as a perez fan i found that performance solid and and looking at the timing screens especially was on on the mediums there is definitely i feel potential for for perez to have a strong start to this season but i kind of i don't want to jinx it so i'm just sitting on that a little bit we really we need to come down the grid a tiny bit i think even past mercedes who weren't the next most interesting story either we need to go i think we need to go to to P7. And I don't want to be like, oh, well, Christian is, is Danish, therefore he's going to want to talk about Kevin Magnussen. But wow, surely you want to talk about Kevin Magnussen. I thought you said P7. Um, I'm confused. Where did he end up? Oh, have I... P5. So oh. it was just a P5. I mean... I wasn't taking into account. I'm so sorry. I wasn't taking... I didn't deduct <laughs> the Red Bulls from my equation because the Mercedes were sitting five and six. So P5 for Kevin Magnussen. My I mean, goodness. It's... I would not... You must have got mad money if you bet on a top six finish for for Kevin Magnussen. I, I wasn't betting on it and I didn't actually even, uh, I mean, understand it when it happened because... And I, and I think actually it's the same for Kevin because Kevin was done with Formula One. He, he he was, uh, I mean, he's been treated uh, kind of bad through his career. He's had some ups and downs. and But he finished nicely with Haas, but it just came to nothing, basically. So he was, uh, the way he felt when he finished uh, Formula 1 was, I didn't do what I came here to do at all. But, uh, but he came to the realization that, at least I had seven years in Formula One. I'm such a lucky guy. And when when you reach that point and then you get the phone call, it's all in, nothing to lose. And that is what happened with Kevin here. And actually, he did he did write a book and he thought he was never going to, to uh, write a Formula One car oh, again. So wait. he revealed his start procedure actually in the book. I'm going <laughs> to reveal he... it to you. Okay. You want to you yeah, yeah, listen yeah, to this? Yeah, uh, because today he did so brilliantly in the start as well. He, he took two places. Uh, and went to P5 from P7. So what he does is his uh, he's opening his diff, his differential, totally. Oh. Then he he uh, pushes his brake balance fully rearward, and then he's he puts his motor brake on max. 
And actually in the book, he says something like, I can't understand why no one's doing this. I can't understand why no one's doing a, a start procedure setting for the car, blah, blah, blah. And people are probably doing that. But uh, <laughs> if he's saying that, he wouldn't have seen it on his uh, his co-drivers or his, uh, his partner drivers. So I think that was a little secret he didn't want it to <laughs> reveal if he knew he was going back to Formula 1. I, um, I like that he revealed that Gunter Steiner had said to him, basically, we want you back, but no promises on car performance. Like, I can't promise you anything. But what a bonus. Yeah. Uh, he actually, he said somewhere that he, the first thing he did was when uh, Gunther called him, they talked for two minutes and he said yes, like uh, <laughs> so almost I. immediately. But then afterwards he called, he has a lot of friends who, uh, some of them works at Ferrari and stuff. And he called some of them and everyone he, he talked to was like, yeah, it's good enough. It's true what they're saying. You have to believe them. And then he just phoned back. Yeah, I'm on. I have to admit, at the start, obviously, with a with a, a small Hamilton kind of leaning, but always been a, a big Kevin Magnussen fan, especially him and him and Grosjean at, at Haas. I loved that pairing. I was devastated to see them be swapped out for, for rookies. I really felt that was such a bad haul. But he was dicing with Hamilton. And at the beginning of the race, I thought, he, he's going to ruin this. He is going to absolutely spoil Mercedes day. Uh, you talk uh, still me uh, yeah, I get yeah, it all yeah. the time because he's a Dane. Uh, yeah. I'm so yeah. glad Kevin is back. Uh, I tell you <laughs> it's going to be my podcast. Yeah, I tell you, Matt, Matt can have an opinion because um, because they're an American team again. I, I can say he, he actually answered this after the the race that uh, he knew that the Mercedes was not gonna. Uh, he, he, it was simply too quick, and I think uh. he was talking about a second or something like that. So he he basically said, "I'm not going to fight this." But the, his two his two uh, brake failures into T1 was actually caused by a left front uh, locking, which is kind of strange because normally it would be a right front. Mm. So that kind of threw him off, and uh, but he got back into the rhythm. Since I've been accused of being a Danist, uh, let's go to a half English, half Dutchman for a comment. <laughs> by the Dane. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be fair, the biggest thing for me was how well K-Mag performed compared to his teammate, um, who obviously got lots and lots of plaudits last season for putting Nikita Mazepin very, very much in the shade. Um, yeah, Who? Mick was, yeah, yeah, Mick was nowhere this weekend. Looked like he struggled all weekend. And, you know, you can talk about different things with the car and all this kind of different stuff, but K-Mag turned up a week ago, got in the car and having been out of the sport for a year and nailed it. I mean, absolutely nailed it. It's the one of the best comeback stories we've had. It's better than any comeback story that Hulkenberg's had. It's like he's really, really good at driving race cars, Matt. It really is. So I, I want to preface this um, by saying that I the job that he did is remarkable. But he spent a year driving prototypes, which are heavier, have more primitive suspension. And there are some... There are some characteristics there that were shared i mean he was driving competitively which i don't believe that hulkenberg was so i i will hand that to him and as far as schumacher goes i think he had a really snake bit weekend he made a mistake yeah. in qualifying or he probably would have made q3 and then on the very first lap he got nerfed by ocon which hurts me to say but <laughs> ocon owned up to it yeah. and he got penalized for it so there's not really much of an argument there um, and it put him into a spin, and I think that just took him out of the race entirely. And also, as we know, young Schumacher is a bit of a grower, if you know what I mean. Yeah, hang on a minute. Yeah. Wait, wait, two seconds. You can't yeah. talk about blame. <laughs> like, like, look, like, Steve, Steve, Uncle Steve doesn't spend ages making these bumpers for nothing. So, whose fault is it? Okay, well, it's slightly ruined because it was definitely it was definitely Ocon's fault. So we can move on. But I had to contractually oblige to pe play the bumper, Christian. On his second timed lap in the Haas in Bahrain during this weekend, Kevin was one tenth of Schumacher, which I found like when I saw that, I thought, okay, this is going to be fun because on your second time run, and the guy had done like I think twenty five or twenty seven uh, laps in the morning morning during testing, that was just heads off. I want to defend Mick Schumacher slightly. A, obviously too early to tell, but I don't mind jumping to a conclusion or two. But if you've spent last year, his, his, his the bar that he was competing against was Nikita Mazepin. And 
let's be let's be frank that was an incredibly low bar so I would say that, you know, as a young man in competition, he was feeling very, very confident. Like, I am, I am smashing this. Like, Mazepin can't be, he can't be that off the pace. He can't be that bad. I must be doing brilliantly. And then a, a genuine world-class driver talent has come in. He's going to have to wake up now and go, ah, okay. So if he is talented, if he is a, a grower, as you say, Matt, then yep. this is his challenge now. You know, give him, give him time, give him time to go, right, okay, I'm still a young driver now I've seen where a, a new bar is. Let's see if he rises to it. Yeah, I agree. And and I feel like, in a way, this is really Schumacher's rookie season. He's got an experienced teammate who's very fast, and he's in a car that can actually drive like Formula One cars drive now. He didn't have either of those last year. Yeah, I, I actually just wanted to say what Mass just said. Uh, he, he's driving midfield now, which is completely different. And he was only one spot away from points. So yeah, that's I mean, caught him some slack. Upper midfield. Upper midfield. At one point, exactly. it, it looked like uh, it looked like Haas was going to be ahead of Mercedes, didn't it, at one point, Matt? Yeah, it did. And the thing, the interesting thing um, I, I saw in Magnuson's post-race interview on F1 TV, was he said, you know, we've been here before, we've had good early season performances, and then we've sort of seen it slip away. He goes, but this this car, this feels different this time. And so I think I think I think it's going to be a push to the end of the season for them to properly develop the car. But if they do, well, I'll just say they're in third place right now in the constructors championship. They certainly are. I watched the onboards during uh, Saturday and the Mercedes, when you see that going around the track, it's a bit understeery in the corner. And as soon as they go on the throttle, it's oversteery. The Haas just, just easy in and out, just easy on the throttle. <laughs> Looks so well driven, that car. All right. Well, let, let's hope, uh, I think, for their sake and the sake of the story, that that is, is genuine pace and we'll see them, you know, fighting. And it's the, the order has shuffled in such an interesting way. That's gonna. I will talk about, I guess, the teams that have been disappointed in a little while. But I want to move next to last year's World Constructors Champions, which is, of course, Mercedes with Lewis Hamilton and George Russell. But first, I'd like to thank you for joining us for the 2022 season there's a million and one podcasts out there so we're glad that you're choosing missed apex if you want to join our patreon community get an ad free feed join us in our live chat and get the extra content which is worse and less focused consider going to patreon.com forward slash missed apex and check out if any of those support tiers uh, uh, seem appealing to you but mostly you're just helping an independent podcast go toe to toe with the the suits and the corporate outfits in the itunes charts or if you want to just go Good job, lads, and chuck a survivor. Click the tip jar or the Patreon link in the show notes below. Okay, Van Jean, you're Ham Fossey. You're a big Hamilton fan. Be honest. Guilty. Going into the season, what did you think? Were you, were you scared of the Russell challenge? Russell is excellent and a worthy challenger to Lewis Hamilton, without a shadow of a doubt. I feel that George will, I still feel George will have Lewis over the odd qualifying. I still feel George will have Lewis over the odd race. But over the course of a season, to be honest, I still won't, don't put anybody really beating Lewis over the course of a season in the same car. Um, but I think George did a good job this weekend. I think he was solid. Um, the misconception is that he screwed up his qualifying lap. What actually happened was uh, they gave him a different procedure for preparing the tyres before uh -huh. the qualifying lap, got to turn one, had no grip, ran, and, and ran wide. Um, so other than if it wasn't for that, he probably would have been a tenth either ahead or behind of Lewis because that's where he'd been all the way through qualifying. Um, but I, I think George has <clears throat> excuse me, all the ability in the world to yeah. be a world champion and there isn't a better learning tree for him to be under than seven time world champion Lewis. Well, well like we said about Mick Schumacher, whose bar was was very low. Obviously, like no I no offense to Latifi, who seems lovely, right? But that was his bar before. And yes, of course, like this nickname Mr. Saturday that was just constantly being no, that was just the performance available to the Williams. It's just Latifi wasn't 
extracting that in the same way because he's a, an out and out, very nice and very competent pay driver. Now his bar, like Schumacher, has been raised significantly and he's got to step up to the Lewis Hamilton challenge, which he may or may not do. Yeah, you know, you're conf- you're you're comparing a out and out pay driver to statistically yeah, the yeah, greatest yeah, yeah. racing exactly, driver of yeah, all yeah. time. Yeah. Of course there's going to be a difference. Um you know, there are a lot of people out there, uh, even even friends in our very close WhatsApp community who just thought he'd come in and absolutely destroy Lewis Hamilton and it's like mm. it's never it's never going to happen. Especially you know, with all due respect to George, he's turning up into a new team where he doesn't know the car, doesn't really know the team. Of course, he's not going to come out there and be out and out quicker. He will get there. But um, at the moment, I think the best thing George can do is just learn from Lewis because I think Lewis is at that stage of his career where he'll happily share wisdom um, as long as he doesn't have George <laughs> trying to fling him off the circuit every race. Yeah, and this is, yeah, I, I think there's definitely there's going to be a at least on paper a start point of lewis seniority i think it would be madness to do anything else from from that scenario and and it, it's not like a vettel thing i think where vettel had fallen out of favor with ferrari and then they got that you know a second driver in then immediately give him a five-year contract just why not just slap vettel in the face uh, but i i think he did a solid job i i I put on twitter that i thought he'd done a solid job all weekend and people were disagreeing with me but he was matching lap for lap, time for time, generally all through the practice sessions, all through qualifying. And then obviously he had to then, because of the start, the quality procedure thing, ended up a few spots back. But he was he was there. He was there with Hamilton. The only thing that really separated them was the strategy, Alex. So, oh, OK, we'll go to you, Matt. I, if you're a Russell fan, I think there's lots of hope for you this season. Yes. Well, two things Russell did. One, he didn't mess up his start, unlike certain other finished former drivers did even in True. this race when they started right next to Hamilton. And two, um, he passed everyone he needed to pass and wound up directly behind his teammate. So if I'm Mercedes, I'm like, yes, this is what we hired you to do. Learn from Hamilton, figure out, you know, figure out what he knows so you can make yourself faster. But he did everything he needed to do. And uh, as Jeansy said, aside from not getting the tires in the correct window for qualifying, it was a pretty spotless weekend for him, so hard to fault. I think no one is surprised when they see George Russell in the in the black overalls because it's just it's like he's been there all the time. And he's yeah. so well integrated in Mercedes already. And, and and you can feel that also in the interviews with him and and the way he he goes about his racing. But don't forget he was, I think, between 15 and 20 seconds behind Hamilton on, on in, in the race. And Hamilton has outraced him the entire weekend. Uh, I mean, in every session, maybe by one and a half tenths, sometimes four and four, five tenths. But it's the same car and it's a new car for both of them. So I, I still I still see Hamilton uh, ahead of uh, uh, Russell. But I think after the summer break, it will be time to evaluate. Ah, interesting. And then a changing of the guard. But I think that will depend as well, Alex, if... You know, if they're in title contention, if they're in title contention and Hamilton is ahead, I've absolutely no doubt that Russell will be asked to to take a more junior role. Maybe Lewis wins his eighth world title and then they and then he's like, right, yours, George, off you go. I've, I've, I've seen how we're going to handle the second year of the regs and uh, and I'm off. Good luck. Yeah, I've been saying this for pretty much since George got announced in the seat, which is a case of take a year, help Lewis win his eighth title, gain his trust and then unleash the beast next season just take this as a learning season don't make i don't want to say don't make the mistake that lewis made in 07 when he joined and literally just upset the apple car Mm. because the problem was when he joined alonso wasn't anywhere near the end of his career i mean the guy's still blooming racing um (laughs) oh yeah so uh, is that what you call what he did today (laughs) yeah we'll get to that um you must be so pleased matt we'll get to Um, that next yeah so so at that point lewis couldn't afford to take a back seat russell can afford a year just to live in lewis's shadow as long as he doesn't get obliterated you know and get dropped by you know multiple distances uh, during the race, like Bottas was doing. As long as he can keep close and keep Lewis honest, by next season, we'll have an animal. Yeah, and, you know, again, barring the dodgy Red Bull fuel pumps, Mercedes isn't there yet. 
So that year might be a year or two, depending upon how quickly Mercedes can solve the current problem that they have. And it was interesting to hear Hamilton post-race talk about the issues, specifically lack of rear downforce and high degradation on the tires, not issues we're normally associating with Mercedes. And it makes me kind of wonder how Saudi Arabia will play out for them there, given the high speed nature of that track. Oh, already looking forward to Saudi. A bit. See, Matt's always thinking, but why don't we get into the, because you know, we last uh, 10 minutes or so before we do our awards, why don't we get into the midfield winners and losers? I think, I think a, a notable kind of mention really that where there's not really much depth, I don't think, to the chat is is the, the alpha star. A, that car looks remarkably gorgeous under the lights. Like I was really struck. I'm not really a livery person, but I was like, wow, that looks like a showroom car doing its thing. But it looked drivable. And also, uh, Joe was able to deliver P10 alongside Bartas's P6. Yes, a little bit of attrition. But that's that's a dream result for Alpha, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, both cars finished, which if you look at their testing was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> yeah. But Joe and his first race in the points, that's amazing for the team. And really, if you looked at the times they were putting down, they're maybe a tenth off the Haas at best at this circuit. So Alpha, I think genuinely and Haas are the two quickest midfield cars at the moment. With Ferrari engines. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, how about that? The reason they've been down in the dumps for so long was the the FIA secret agreement with Ferrari where we don't know whether or not they were caught cheating and then made a special deal to kind of be nerfed for a couple of seasons. But that that if it did happen, if it did happen Alex, you know that that's why they were down there in the first place. So this is kind of scales of justice. Do you think Ferrari said okay, we'll hold our engine off till 2022? So they're just oh. using the 2017 and 2018 engine. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I, I wonder what it allegedly was. <laughs> Where are they pooling fuel this time? Okay, you didn't the, say allegedly enough. Okay, go on. The rumors about Haas and Ferrari sharing wind tunnel things have started to emerge again. And uh, uh, Otmar has been uh, one of the guys who has been accused of saying it. Martin Brundle have been talking about it. But every time Ferrari has a bit of success, this will come up, I think. Mm. Okay, trumpets. Brad Philpot, last that week, was it last week when we were going through the teams, we were talking about Alpine for about five minutes and he put his hand up and he went, why are we talking about the most meh team on the grid? I'm bored. Tell us why we should be interested in Alpine. Well, aside from the fact that Otmar is now at Alpine, aside from the fact that Ocon and Alonso are there, uh, they actually had a pretty decent race finish. And they are, again, uh, both in the points. And had Ocon not picked up that five-second penalty, he would have been P6, I think, pretty pretty easily. I think, I think the Alpha may be faster, but he was, because he had a better start, as did Alonso. The thing that interests me is how badly Alonso lost out at this race. He could not keep his tires alive at all. And he was, you know, by five or six laps into a stint, he was well off the rest of the midfield's pace. And it was really only the safety car and fresh tires that saved him at the end. No, so you're pushing your Ocon agenda to say you think he's got the measure of Alonso. And the thing is, lad's, lad's 41 now, isn't he? Is he 41? I think, I, I think I'm older than all the F1 drivers. Uh-oh. I think it's happened, um, Alex. I think I'm older than all the <laughs> F1 drivers, finally. Yeah, I'm I'm the only one older than me currently is Fernando. Oh. <laughs> so Fernando so Fernando can stay forever just enjoying his <laughs> casual Sunday drive as everyone just keeps driving past him. Um so yeah, so Alonso did nothing this weekend really. He did a good qualifying actually. He outqualified Ocon, didn't he? Um but yeah, I mean, I think I think I saw Ocon pass Alonso like three times today. <laughs> you mean Ocon with the old body work, not the new body work? Blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah, well, yeah, he, blah, shouldn't blah, have, blah. he shouldn't have lost his body work in practice then, should he, Matt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he shouldn't have been driving that fast or else it wouldn't have come off. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it allowed to ask a small tire question in regard to Alonso? Go for it. Sure. So, Matt, did you, did you experience when, uh, when the tires went off for Alonso, they went really fast off? It was like, yes. I'm losing my tires. 
they're gone. Yeah, no, I, and I was amazed because you could see on on the timing app the delta between Alonso and Ocon. He would start out about the same pace, and then in five laps he would be almost a second a lap slower. And yeah, exactly. didn't matter which tire he put on. That no. was a thing that was really amazing to me. And he tried and them all know, apparently, didn't he? Yeah, they 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 all did. I don't know if it was his driving style or if it was something just peculiar to the setup of Alonso's car, but it was not good. Is it because you can't teach an old dog new tricks? And he's had so much new stuff to learn that he just couldn't get on with it. Uh, Sorry, I, is my anti is my anti Alonso bias coming out? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, but it's 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 a good point. I mean, it could if it's a driving style thing, then it might be a real problem for the whole season, but. They will obviously seek to solve it with setup as much as they can. So obviously Alonso's hope has been that at some point Alpine, Renault are going to be up there challenging for race wins and challenging for a championship again. He's had a disastrous run at McLaren, a sabbatical, now Alpine waiting, like so many people waiting on this forever promise of, of Renault up there fighting with the manufacturers. It could be that he's, you know, he's, he's turned up at qualifying and gone, oh, Looks like we're fighting Alpha Romeo, maybe Alpha Tauri. You know, a, a, a title push might have got his his forty year old butt motivated, but maybe it's just not as motivating for him. Ocon's got so much more to fight for. Yeah, and let's face it: the less motivated and the more disgruntled Alonso is, the more entertainment we will all get from his radio <laughs> messages, won't we? Yeah, I'm down for that. Let's talk about the losers. Well, it's all the Mercedes teams uh, down at the bottom. <laughs> Pretty much. I, I think, you know, the, the elephant in the room, which I think a lot of us have been trying to, to not think about too much, especially maybe those of us uh, with a, a Brit leading bias, uh, is the just disastrous start from um, from McLaren for, and, and to see Lando Norris and Daniel Ricciardo really struggling. And I mean, it wasn't even... Like one thing, Alex, it was like, it was everything. They were down on pace. Then they had a bad start and then they didn't, the race didn't seem to be good. And then the tactics didn't seem to make any sense. It was just, it was like, wow, it was bad. Sorry, McLaren fans, but wow. If, you know, as far as teams go, McLaren have always been my team. And through testing at Spain, it looked like, oh, you know, they could be up there fighting mm. for, for at least podiums. And then it all just went away. And I don't think they even know. Um, they've got they've got no low speeds lo, low low speed corner speed. Um they've got no porpoising, but they're probably having to ride their car too high. Um and they've got no power. And I just don't get it. And you saw the interviews with Daniel Ricardo and Lando after the race, and they both just looked clueless <sighs> as to we drove, you know, no different to what we normally drive. I haven't forgotten how to drive a racing car, but there was nothing there. Like the, the car had nothing to give. And I think they're just absolutely lost in a wilderness of, I don't know. I tell you what, Christian Pedersen will give us a full breakdown of why we should be super optimistic about McLaren going forward. Uh, Come on, Christian. <laughs> not sure. Well, let me say it like this. If let's say indeed it is the Mercedes engine. If so, then Williams have done a really good job because now they are on par with McLaren. So it can't really just be the engine because no. you have, I mean, if McLaren lost as much as was between them and, and Williams last year, they've done something really, really wrong. I can't figure out what's going on, to be honest. I think I, I think I figured it out, actually, Matt. You know the movie Freaky Friday or all any other kind of weird body swap stuff? Do you think that happened with McLaren and Haas? They, like, found a wishing well or something and they just Maybe. swapped? That's the only explanation, isn't no, it? No, it makes sense to me. I, yeah. I would completely buy that. So let's hope that's not genuine. Just, you know, for McLaren driver's sakes and, and two drivers that I, I broadly like... But it's it's such a big drop. It, it would be as much as the Haas elevation is one of the highest season turnarounds I can remember for a long time because they were nowhere last season. If McLaren are genuinely down there, that's one of the biggest, hardest falls since the last time McLaren did this. Yeah, it's, you know, they're always winners and losers. 
and regulation changes. And I honestly, I'm only jumping in to say I was convinced that McLaren was not one of the losers. But remember, at the second test, they suddenly had these brake cooling issues. They could only run 10 laps at a time. And now they're trying to solve that. Plus, they essentially lost their entire second test. So maybe their design is still workable, but they're very far behind. We should not forget that Bahrain is a different track compared to what's the norm in Formula One. And some teams has just never been good at Bahrain. And I think that goes for McLaren, actually. I might be wrong, but I, I think I remember that. Uh, and uh, I think it was uh, Alfa Tauri is always good in Bahrain and stuff like that. So everything can change next week. Yeah, we shouldn't forget that. We, we did say that Bahrain was probably a, a better choice for race one than, uh, than Melbourne because it's more representative, but it isn't like completely representative. Uh, you, know, they, you know, it's a dusty track. You've got high winds big temperature changes so and it favors a certain type of car yeah so as like because well. because it's stop start a little bit lots of slow corners i guess um i'm trying to remember is it the same track for saudi arabia with the the walls of death is it, it the is same? it's the same uh, one they've changed no? it a little bit but it's a high fa- i mean fast track. very fast mm. yeah yeah Okay, so we might see different cars again um, looping to the front because uh, some of those Mercedes teams will really, really be hoping for a change of fortune. Uh, But we're coming to the end of the show now, but we do like to give out some awards on our podium. Wow, I tell you what, guys, I had fun watching that race. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed seeing the grid being mixed up and I've, I've had a lot to cheer about in my personal fandom in Formula One over the last several years. We've seen Lewis Hamilton win a bunch of championships. I have to say, I've also enjoyed watching Lewis Hamilton in the, the wilderness years between 2008 and 2014. And 2013, I, I often cite as one of the most enjoyable seasons following Lewis Hamilton away from that cutting edge uh, thrust uh, up at the front, you know, d- dicing with uh, Nico Hulkenberg for, uh, for for eighth place might not be as glamorous, but you can still follow your drivers wherever they are uh, on the grid. And obviously I've been spoiled by uh, midfield plucky victories from Sergio Perez as well, and then seeing him get another chance at a, at a top team. So wherever your driver has ended up, wherever your favourite team has ended up, even you, McLaren, Fans and Norris fans, I understand that's a bit harder. There's a lot to enjoy uh, with the the battles where they are. But I tell you one thing, the sport of Formula One looks pretty healthy outside of the newspapers and uh, and the boardroom shenanigans that have occupied all of winter. On track, things look great. It looks like cars can race each other and overtake and re-overtake and fight. The, The cars look like they can follow better which seems to make the DRS much more interesting. So you can, people can use the DRS to hang on to a faster car, which you couldn't do last season because you'd get too much uh, aero weight. But it looks like, I mean, we were looking at Hamilton hanging on to the back of Perez for a little bit and taking advantage of that. The racing looks good. The order has been changed. And like I said, it looks like we've got a, a possible crescendo of three teams and six drivers all kind of culminating and swapping positions all throughout the season. So as, as as an F1 fan, I am incredibly excited about this season and I, I hope you are too. But what we do here at the end of Missed Apex podcast is we, we like to give out a bunch of awards where, you know, we put our judgy pants on a little bit. We do a good thing award, a bad thing award, a pony award. And then after the show for the live stream, uh, we'll hand out comment of the week as well for our best chat room comments. But let's start off with our thing of the weekend. Okay, well, this is the bit of the show where we get to be all super positive, so that's nice. Why don't I go to you, Alex, first? What was your thing of the weekend? Do I go obvious? Do I go the thing that made me happiest? Or do I go thing that made me most for my fandom? <laughs> it's your choice. Um, if no so one else I- takes the other ones, we can roll back to you. I will go with the thing that made me happy, happiest, which was Charles Leclerc 
making Max Verstappen look a bit silly. Um, <laughs> Alex. With that overtake, the, the way he just baited Max in, knew exactly what Max was going to do and completely took advantage of him to the point where Max got so frustrated, he locked up his wheel and then never was in contention again. Um, so Charles Leclerc, I mean, along with your absolutely flawless weekend, hats off to you. You are my thing of the weekend. Well, okay. Uh, email uh, feedback at mistapex.net and just make sure the subject line is I hate Alex and here's why. Okay. That's, that was nothing to do with me. Uh, at me on Twitter. Oh, yeah. At Alex Van Jean on Twitter. Yes, of course. Um, you can do that. Okay. So uh, Matt is at MattPT55 on Twitter and you can now give us your thing of the weekend. It doesn't have to be a driver. Remember, it can be like a feeling. It could be a, a, a marshal. It's going to be that sweet P5 feeling of Kevin Magnuson. There is just no, I mean, look, believe me, the tires, the duel, turn 19, everything about this race was, it was all so exciting. But Magnuson, ah, yeah. Okay. Well, Christian, is Nick yours? Uh, what, what, yeah. Well, I'm going to, you mean my five things, right? Okay. My, yes. Okay. So I'm going to just going to do them swiftly. The yellow markings on the cars to, uh, to make them easier to identify. Yes. I love it. That helps Race. so much. That was brilliant. Yes. Yes. Mm. yes. And Hamilton's helmet helps yeah. as well. Race control in general, the new rules. Love it. The Ferrari engine, uh, Ben Edwards commentary on F1 TV. He's back. I love ah, listening to him. That's where he went. And then, of course, the meeting between uh, Hulkenberg and K-Mag on the grid when they had to take the picture. They actually fist bumped and stuff oh. like that. <laughs> and they and, and and according to Kevin, they didn't talk for years after that incident. Really? So, that's interesting. Sparks fly today. <laughs> okay. Well, that's fantastic. And my thing of the weekend, I'm going to give it to... I think Ross Braun and the team that came up with these regulations and the and the you know there was a long promise all the way really from when Liberty took over to these regulations and listening to the teams all the way down to having the show and tell and being present when the teams are deciding stuff and so that they're right on top of the engineering and the design they've, they've manufactured a set of rules here which seem to be working, and it's really positive. As a lifelong fan of Formula One, I've seen these cars come out on track. I've seen them race one race, which was a, actually, apart from the safety car, a pretty bog-standard, interesting, tactical, but not a fireworks race. But there was so there was so much there, even down to the, the way the tyres are behaving, taking things on board, like changing the tyre the, the blanket, situation and they've just they look like they have just torn stuff down and instead of just letting the teams do what they want they've gone okay what are we trying to achieve and then set the regulations to fix that so initial initial grade is very positive hats off to them oh that's all lovely and positive isn't it now we get to do like the one where we we get to be a bit mean i guess no, you missed the Apex. It's the Missed Apex Award, where we sit and be all judgy from sofas and sheds. Alex Van Jean, let's go for you again. Who missed the all Apex? The, all the Mercedes engine cars. Well, surely that's just In, the Mercedes engine then. I, you know, so I, I don't know. It must be something to do with, 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 that, with that power unit. But, geez, to see all, apart from obviously Merck themselves, to see the... Four other four. How many? How many other cars? Four, six cars. Four. Yeah. Four other cars, literally taking up the four bottom positions in the standings. Hurts, isn't it? Through the majority of that race was painful. Um, alleviated a little bit by the um, Red Bull power unit going. But um... Alex, we're not meant to. <laughs> you're not meant to gloat about it. Sorry, did that come out? Was that live? Like, um, do you know what? Yeah, I'm going to so... take a serious, like, a, not a semi-serious issue with that. Like, it's it, it's the tennis thing where if you if your person does a really good shot and you applaud, they did a good shot. Yes, well done. That's good. If your person you're supporting his opponent like hits it into the net, you don't cheer them hitting it into the net. You don't cheer the mistake I'm, if you like. I, I I am being I'm being purposely obtuse you're being and very I, mean. t- I, I do have my tongue buried deep <laughs> in my course, cheek of course um and and uh before we go to to christian i just want to again point to your observation of toto wolf being very 
coy about talking about the engine and wanting to point specifically to the aero. That is, that's a good observation because if it definitely wasn't the engine, he could probably come out and go, nah, engine's, engine's mint, it's firing on all cylinders, it's great, which he, which he didn't do. Um, missed the Apex Award? Do you have a missed Apex Award? I actually wrote down Mercedes engines, as uh, oh, I like said, but uh, I'm going to say Christian Horner because uh, I feel, uh, I know this is the first race and oh, maybe well. he's been watching the Drive to Survive series and realized maybe I have to change something, but something has to change within that team. I think, uh, I hope they realize that they need to change a bit of perspective because it's a, they're just, it's just not working, I think. Well, they've, they've, PR got, machine. they've got the number one on one of their cars now. I think they, yeah. they, they can't blame Then you the... have to be humble, man. It's, uh, that is when you, the humbleness starts, isn't it? They certainly can't play the, the plucky underdog or the, the put-upon card. Exactly. Christian Horner was still in interviews saying, oh, all the decisions went against us, and it was a very kind of like... I, I don't know if he believes that, uh, Matt. Uh, well, my missed Apex would be um you know everyone's like mercedes missed the boat but as far as i can count 100 percent of mercedes engines finished the race while as 75 percent of red bulls did not so i think if we're going to have a missed apex we're going to have to look at that a little bit too yeah so you're going to give your missed apex award what to uh, the red bull power unit which 304 did not finish honda are they not claiming it's honda it's not called uh, Honda. It, it, it's, uh, I don't, it, you know, it's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> Technically, I think it's a Red Bull power unit, but Honda makes it, but it's Red Bull because Honda's like a contractor. So, yeah. I think I'm going to have to give the Missed Apex Award, unfortunately, to McLaren and whatever is going on there. And uh, like you said, the, the drivers look baffled because they're, they're going, well, we... We're quite good at driving race cars, and we were doing all the things that make us good at driving race cars, and it was both of them. And and, and it does look, by the way, in this current era, it, I bet the drivers are going to make much more of a, a difference. You can see driver performance come through. But the two good drivers, both of them, uh, nowhere, and uh, they've got to fix that quickly. So let this missed Apex Award motivate them, because you know I'm, I'm sh I may have overegged the importance of of this award. But uh, what's what's up, trumpets? No, the chat room, I'll share it later after the show. Sorry. Okay, we've got one award left, which is the Pony Award. Daddy, I want a pony. And I want it now. Van Jean, do you have any candidates for pony? Oh, let me, let me think. It was a long race. We had quite a few messages. It's, um, it's Mr. Um, there's a, there's a yellow flag at turn one dummy on the circuit, Max Verstappen. Um, wow. He was an angry boy today. Now I'm starting to feel like we shouldn't be hearing these driver messages. Although we did have a very funny comment in the live chat. I've forgotten who it was. I'm so sorry, but someone went, you're not my real race strategist. And, and that, that had me giggling for, for a good part of the uh, show. But anyway, uh, thank you very much. I don't want to end on that negative note, Van Jean. So Matt, you say something. Because that's why people should come and join our Patreon so they can be in the live chat and see these as they happen. There's so many more that we don't get to, and they are all just hilarious and funny. Excellent. Uh, we are going to be doing some midweek uh, patron only content. It's not you're not going to miss out on anything if you don't do it. It's not like, oh, we saved the best information uh, for a Patreon paywall. But it is a chance for me and Matt and others to jump on and have a bit of a more relaxed chat. And we'll, we'll take our doom scrolling spirit, which was our old podcast where we used, used to, you know, complain about our our lives in general as well. So if you fancy that, do consider going and checking out our Patreon. It's at the link below. But if not, oh, I guess we'll be back next Sunday for Race 2's race review. I, I think it's going to be 8 p.m. live. If the races are a bit later, then we try and get to it as soon as we can. But Sunday night, we might be wrong, but we're first. And sometimes we're wrong about being first. Until we see you next, work hard, be kind, and have fun. This was Missed Apex Podcast. <laughs>